Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Unstoppable Leadership. We have our guest today, Derek Van Nice, and he is going to talk about some tax breaks for small business. Who doesn't want to hear about that? So ladies and gentlemen, grab your pens, grab your pencils. If you happen to have crayons, whatever you have near, sit down and write down some notes because I have a feeling there's going to be a ton of nuggets in this podcast for you. Welcome, Derek. And it's awesome that you're able to jump on and especially to talk about a topic that any business owner wants to know about is how they can save some money. Absolutely, Don. Excited to be here. And you're absolutely right. Like, I think a lot of people dread taxes. But what we have a tendency to forget is that every dollar you save is the same as a new dollar earned, right? If it doesn't go to Uncle Sam, it stays in your bank account. It adds to the bottom line. And I think a lot of us think taxes are a dirty thing, so we don't pay attention to them and we just miss out. We definitely yeah, do. So. And so what got you started in that realm of understanding tax breaks for small business? Well, you know, it's interesting because I would have never thought that I would like taxes that much. And I, I suppose I don't love taxes. What I really love is helping people keep money or get money back even. So I, my, my company, Big Life Financial, we actually focus on helping people grow their money strategically for small business owners. But a huge part of that is just how to pay less taxes. It just became so prevalent and people kept asking, how do I save taxes? How do I pay less? How do I keep more? Uh, we just we had to get good at it, right? So I started working with CPAs. Uh, uh, we figured out how people can file for research and development credits and what do high income people do versus people who are just getting started. And you just start figuring out like there's different tiers and levels of knowledge to this. And as clients needed it, we just had to had to learn it with by working with good people. Wow, that's definitely, that's the first time I've heard of about research and development credit. So let's dive into that a little bit. What is that all about? And can your average small business owner tap into that? Yeah, so I will tell you this, like for small business owners, research and development credits are kind of a new thing. Like they've been around since the 80s for the big companies. But like in 2015, they passed some rules with the PATH Act under the Obama administration that kind of got rid of a lot of the red tape and made it so that it's not so expensive and doesn't need so much documentation. So the average small business can apply, but it doesn't apply to everybody. But if somebody's in medical manufacturing, construction or software development, like those are total home runs. Now, from what I know about Unstoppable Entrepreneur and a lot of the people I know there, they're not as many of those types of brick and mortar or person to person businesses that way. But mm -hmm. Really anything that's science-based, uh, I do have a bunch of wellness coaches who do testing and scientific evaluation and, and all of that for their clients. Like it can apply to a lot of that. We've got several of those kinds of people who are getting thirty to $60,000 back. I mean, they're successful, oh, wow. so they're running money through their business. But um, And then uh, anything that you're doing where you're based in science, you're evaluating alternatives, you're testing new approaches, you're um, trying new new materials or new approaches with stuff can qualify. The big thing there for some businesses is trying to figure out how do we tie that to science? And that's really where the art comes in. And truly, because it's a new thing, like we're always figuring out new ways to qualify for research, right? And so it, the, like the science is the numbers are the numbers. How much money did you pay in taxes? How much did you spend on certain things? and there's a multiplier, but then how many of those dollars can we make qualify for research? And that's really where having some professionals makes a big difference. Uh, we have teams of CPAs and this is their whole specialty and they're always trying new stuff to see what will work. And that's amazing that you mentioned science along with that, because that's something that is definitely needed in no matter what you do. And especially when you're talking about changing mindset and changing the neuro pathways of your brain. That's what I started thinking about when you started talking about science. I was going like the science behind that, which does tie into some small businesses and you're right, 
it ties mostly into the health and wellness realm, mm -hmm. but I do have quite a few of my listeners that are definitely in that industry. So that would definitely be something that would be helpful to them. So mm -hmm. if y'all are listening, I would start <laughs> taking notes because that is something that you could definitely tap into and utilize. So yes. that's right. amazing that it's out there. Yeah. And I'll add one more thing. The, the neat thing about this, is the companies that I represent and work with, they're, they're willing to look at it for, for free and give you an estimate. So we can see if you think you might qualify, all we have to do is fill out a form, send them your taxes. They look at it and within a week or two, they'll come back and say, hey, there's money on the table or there's not. So you really don't have anything to lose by trying. And honestly, sometimes the best ones are the ones that were like, I, I don't know if this is gonna qualify, let's send it in. Like uh, we had a guy who owned a Chick-fil-A you wouldn't think a Chick-fil-A would, but as it turns out, their corporate headquarters does all this research on, on food prep and flavors and all this kind of chemistry and all these preservatives and different sorts of things. And uh, all that rolls down to the franchise owners. So they got like six figures back and it was just like, wow, I didn't expect that, but that's super cool. <laughs> <laughs> that is super cool. And yeah, you're right. I would have never thought it took filet ever. <laughs> me, me neither. Like it, it's just one of those, like, let's just throw darts at the board on this one because there's no cost. And, uh, and it came up a winner. That is freaking amazing. So what's another good tax break? Let's talk about service providers, because I know that that's a huge one, especially now with COVID going on, a lot of business owners have switched more to the service model than the physical model of business. So what would you suggest for service owners? Well, for service owners, uh, especially if you've got some people on your team, uh, a big a big point is uh, you don't have to take all of your income that goes from the business into you. Don't take it all as salary. If you can pay yourself uh, for distributions or dividends, um, then you don't have to pay the self-employment tax on that portion, right? And my disclaimer is I'm not a CPA. I work with CPAs. I do the high level. Check with your professional to make sure this applies for you. But uh, but the reality is like a, a big mistake I see is people start making more and more money and they take it all as salary, right? They're paying themselves $5,000, $10,000, $15,000 a month. What you really need to take is if you could replace yourself with a salaried employee, let's say you could replace yourself for $50,000 a year, that extra 100,000 that you're paying yourself can come to you as distributions, right? Because that's like almost like passive income. You don't have to actively be doing it. You should be able to take that income and you won't pay that extra seven and a half percent. So that can be a big swing, especially if you're making a good portion of money, you know, once you get over 100,000, but even if you're making 50,000, could save you 3,500 bucks or, or a couple thousand bucks. Yeah. So, uh, so that's a real simple one that I see like every single day and the more money you make, the bigger it gets. Yeah, definitely. And that's one of the things that I think a lot of small business owners, you're right. We get ourselves into trouble because we're kind of like, Oh yeah, we're getting this money and we're just continuously taking a salary. But I learned a long time ago, don't do that. <laughs> Once you start getting to a certain point, there's different ways to allocate that. And you're correct. None of us are CPAs. So if you're listening to this podcast, please consult your tax advisor. Can please consult your CPA. Those people have been doing this for a long time. They know what you can and cannot do. Yep. Um, I think some of us small business owners get ourselves in trouble by trying to do our own taxes. I, me, I've got <laughs> my <laughs> So, um, yes, take advantage of that CPA. They're well worth that money. And so would that be a good suggestion for small business owners to hire a CPA versus trying to do it themselves? Yeah, so I would say once you're paying more than five to ten thousand dollars a year in taxes, now it's worth it to pay someone else, right? Like in the front end, if you're only paying a couple thousand bucks, like hiring a CPA to do that uh, may not may not pan out. But I think once you start hitting that five thousand dollars in taxes, that means you're probably bringing home fifty thousand dollars or more, even after all your write-offs and stuff. So you're probably starting to do okay. 
because as a business owner, if you're paying taxes on 50 grand, you're probably making closer to 100 or 150. Yeah. So uh, I would say at that point, you really want to have a, a tax pro because that seems to be, you know, the businesses have a tendency to snowball as they start to snowball you go from 100 to 250 and all of a sudden taxes get awfully expensive. So having a pro on your team and being proactive, like that's the biggest thing that I see all the time, Don, is people think taxes is something you figure out after December 31st and you just can't wait. Like my my high net worth clients, people who make four or 500,000 plus a year in taxable income, like they're finishing up stuff right now that needs to be in by October 15th so that they can have the tax breaks because it's going to take that long to process some of those uh, some of those investment moves and some of the moves they're going to make to get these big write offs uh, against their income that can't you can't wait until December to do that stuff or it just won't happen. So the more proactive you can be, the better. Yeah. And I think that's definitely that's where I fall into that loop is because I'm still also working full time for an employer. So it's one of those things you always want to put off because you're going to like, man, I don't want to have to deal with this. And you better deal with it because if not, it's going to come and bite you if you don't. Um, yep. So what's another good tip that you have out there for either physical business owners or service business owners? What What's some of the things that you're seeing right now that are trending? Well, and I don't even know if this stuff is trends, but like another really popular one is if you own your own home. Okay. If you own your own home, there's a rule. Check with your CPA. Uh, it's, it's affectionately known as the Augusta rule. And it's a way that you can rent out your primary residence up to 14 days a year, tax-free. Now, you may not want to rent your business out to strangers. Uh, I'm sorry, rent, rent your home out to strangers, but you can rent your home to your business. So if you ever have people over for retreats or you host clients or you have events or you do anything with your home, your business can rent your home from you. And I would charge something consistent with, like, let's say you're going to use a 800 square feet of your home, right? Like the living room, dining area to host a couple of people for some reason or another. Uh, look at what it would cost to get a conference room in a local hotel for 800 square feet. A lot of times it's a thousand plus dollars or more. You can pay yourself that much. You can document that that is consistent with what's happening in the marketplace. And then that money comes to you tax free. So it's a way to get money from the business into your hands and you can do that up to 14 days a year and the name comes from uh there was a guy who owned property near the augusta golf course uh, it's called the, where they play the masters oh, okay. and and he wanted to be able to rent his home out for the two weeks around the golf tournament and keep all that money and somehow it got put into the tax code so yeah you can check in on the augusta rule if you own a primary home that's another one that a lot of people can use I, yeah, I was just say I've never heard of that. So that's definitely interesting. So when I get to that point, because I am thinking about doing masterminds retreats. So when you think mm -hmm. about those things, mm -hmm. and especially if you live in an area and if you live on some major acreage and you have the room to do it, then why not? I mean, it's better than trying to, especially now with COVID going on, trying to find a hotel, trying to find accommodations, trying to space out people. I mean, all of that stuff. So that might be something that you might want to think about because in the long run, it not only will save you money, but it also gives you money back. Absolutely. And another big thing there is uh, think about the weekends or the weeks that are really expensive. Like every city's got their, you know, Kentucky Derby or like here in Salt Lake City during Sundance, the two weeks of Sundance, is very expensive. So if you do your event for your business during that time, the rates will be way higher. So you can rent your house to your business for a lot more money because of those dates. So another consideration is if you're going to do these things, thinking about doing them when you can really charge your business the most legitimately. Yeah. Right. Definitely. And it's interesting that you bring up Salt Lake City. So i bet that they keep that in mind when it's time for all of the MLM conventions too, because I know Salt Lake City yeah. is big for that, especially <clears throat> for Young Living, which I've done Young Living. So I know how 
awesome it gets and how busy it gets in Salt Lake. And if you've never been to Salt Lake, people, <laughs> oh, Lord, I mercy. That place is huge. And you don't realize how big it is unless you're coming in during nighttime, which that's when we had come in. And to see all of these lights and like a bowl and you're coming down from the mountains and I'm going like, holy scamoles, this place <laughs> is huge. But it still has sort of a small town feel to it as well, especially when you're out in the convention area of Salt Lake City. And it's just amazing to be able to have that. And I think we actually rented out a Airbnb. I think it's in Park City part of Utah, Salt Lake, uh -huh. Utah, if I remember right. And we absolutely loved it. Um, we actually want to go back for vacation. So yeah. it's pretty amazing. P Park City is absolutely beautiful. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. We loved it. We loved it. We ended up on a, I think, course, you know, it's close to the mountain. So we're up on the side of a mountain, but it was so peaceful and so quiet. I wouldn't have traded it for anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So what's another good tip that you have for small business owners to help them save some money? Okay. So this one's super obvious, but I have to say it. If I skip it, like you need to be writing off your home office, your mileage, your cell phone use, your internet use, like all of these things, you can't write off the whole thing, right? Like if you have a home office, it needs to be designated as office. If you're just sitting on your couch working, that's probably not going to work. But if you have like a dedicated room or a dedicated portion of a room, uh, be able to like measure it off square footage wise, see how large it is um, and account for that. Let's say it's 500 square feet that you use for, for a little bit of filming and a few other things uh, and your house is 2000 square feet you should be able to write off roughly 25% of the money that you're paying on your, your mortgage or your rent. Um, and then of course, car mileage, you can write off, I think it's 58 cents a mile. I forget exactly, but it's a significant amount. And if you're driving a lot for work and going out to meetings and, and whatever, I know with COVID people are driving a little bit less this year, but still like it really adds up over time, especially oh, yeah. if you're just getting started those couple of things are probably worth at least a couple thousand dollars uh, worth of savings. I remember one year uh, when I, I had an MLM company that I was probably 25 and I was going to get like $300 back. And then I mentioned that I had this Melaleuca business at the time. And he asked me about my mileage and some of the other things. And yeah, I paid for internet and I had a cell phone and all this stuff. And I ended up getting like $1,800 back instead of 300 or whatever. It made like a $1,500 difference at that time in my life, that was a big chunk of cash. So, mm -hmm. you know, all these little things and uh, add up and, and that's really a kind of how it goes with taxes is there's no silver bullet. I mean, there are when you get to the high end stuff, but for the most part, it's a bunch of little things. Oh, we can write off this or we can write off that and we'll go through a couple more. But, you know, if you're not taking all your money in salary and you're using the Augusta rule and you're writing off your home office and you're, um, your mileage and stuff, just those three things, they might add up to 10, 12, $15,000 that you don't pay in taxes. Neither one of them, none of those is like a super home run, but they're all worth a couple thousand bucks and it starts to add up for people. And where I come from 15 grand a year will really help save for college. Definitely. And that's, that's the thing is the little, the little things and the mileage thing that I loved using was stride and mm -hmm. you can actually download. Now, most of these apps, you can actually download. I think it's a spreadsheet. It'll download an Excel spreadsheet and it'll have all of your stuff on there. As long as you're good about starting and stopping your mileage and putting your receipts. Oh, that's another good one. <laughs> receipts. Yeah. Would you recommend that everybody save their receipts or at least take pictures of them? Yeah. I mean, I think the more you can document it, the better, right? Like what I typically do is I have a receipt and then I'll write at the top of it, like, was it for an event? And was I with a person? And what did we talk about? Like just, you know, young living, uh, uh, Don, and that we talked about marketing strategies or whatever over lunch or whatever it might be. So I do, I do do all that. Uh, I've tried to take pictures. I find that I do better personally keeping track of the physical versus the pictures, yeah. but I have several friends who do everything on Evernote and they tag them all and organize them by events. And I'm just not quite that organized. 
So I, I come home and paperclip them together and, and have them all where I can kind of find them if I need them. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's really important to, to organize all that stuff and have it because if you ever get audited, you have to prove it, right? Yeah. And so even if you can't prove everything, if most of what you're showing is accurate and you've got receipts, you're going to be in a lot better position than if you just don't have anything. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things. So talking about being organized, what is one of the biggest softwares that you recommend small business owners use to help with not only organization, but also with some of those tax breaks and maybe make it easier for their CPA? <laughs> Well, I, I, I am a big fan of QuickBooks. I know it's like super cliche and almost everybody uses it when they get to a certain point, but there's some real power in being able to look at it and say, hey, especially from a cash flow perspective, this is less of a tax thing. I mean, it is a tax thing in the sense that this time of year, we're nine or 10 months into the year and it's like, okay, where am I at income wise? Where do I think I'm going to end up? Do I need to consider some some things for the, for tax wise? But also being able to look at where's my revenue coming from. You know, I've got money coming in here and here and here. Like, what's my return on investment for marketing? And where where are we really bringing in the income? Where am I looking at my expenses and having that broke uh, broken down on your uh, profit and loss, right? And looking at your income and expenses, just being able to see like, where's all that money going out and realizing, wow, you know what? I spent $50,000 last year traveling to all these events. Was that worth it? Uh, or was it a waste of time, right? Um, yes. And I, I spent $10,000 on pay-per-click with Google and we made way more money. So maybe I should do more of that and less of the other or, or whatever. But I think QuickBooks really helps you to start to see what's going on. And I think a lot of people get scared. But listen, hiring a bookkeeper is so cheap. I mean, yeah. I know multiple multiple bookkeepers that are 100 bucks a month or something for you to not have to deal with all that and to have accurate information it's just such a big deal. So uh, having a bookkeeper and having QuickBooks in a way that you can look at things and see what's actually happening with your business, it really helps you make good decisions for taxes and otherwise. Yeah. And I think that's definitely a good thing, especially if you are the creative type, because I have quite a few entrepreneurs that I'm friends with that they're the tattoo artists, they're the artists, they're the photographer. So they're not really into all of this you know, bookkeeping, they would rather somebody else take that. And for them to be able to just pay $100 a month for somebody to do that is actually priceless because that frees them up to continue to do what they need to be doing in order to bring that cash flow in. And it's a good point that you may when you start talking about where your cash flow and where your expenses are going. Is it, you know, beneficial to keep going to all these conferences, you know, because I think sometimes we're in that um, we have to go. <laughs> and yeah. and I, in all honesty, you really probably don't. There is a ton of stuff that is online now that you really don't have to. I mean, there's quite a few things that I was part of virtual, um, virtual classes, virtual this, virtual that. And I've gotten more out of that because number one, um, at home. Number two, mm -hmm. I've got more time. I'm not having to travel. I'm not having to worry about airlines. I'm not having to worry about a hotel. I'm not having to worry about trying to rush to the airport. You know, all of those things that adds up because not only are you saving money and time, and I think for a lot of us, it's more of a time factor. I mean, if your business and you're flying everywhere, is that $50,000 expense really worth your time more than sure. anything? And I think that's where a lot of small business owners need to really dig into that. Is it really worth it? I mean, I have people that will tell me a lot of times the things that we've done in the past is more conducive to an email <laughs> than, than to even a meeting. So think about that as a small business owner when you do these things and when you do masterminds, is it going to be worth having people over to your home to write it off? You know, or is sure. it going to be more profitable to do it online? And at the end of the day, you can, you know, take a step back and breathe a little bit versus, you know, having to play a host 24 seven for, you know, a good couple of days. So those are those things to think about. 
So what's another good tip that you see that a lot of small business owners make a mistake on when it comes to not only maybe growing their money, but also saving their money? Well, an another big one tax wise, just to get money out of the business and into your hands is, uh, and there's a right way and a wrong way to do this. Once again, talk to your CPA about it, but you can actually pay your children uh, up to about $12,000 a year. And that money is going to come from the business to the kids. And it, it needs to go to them in their name, in their bank account. You can be a co-signer on that bank account. Um, but now the kids can help pay for their own schooling, their own clothes, their own vacations, their own stuff. But it's with money that's that's not being taxed, right? And the way that you can justify this, especially if your kids are young, right? It's one thing if you got a 14 year old and they can help you do video editing or social media or these kinds of things. And you should have them doing that just so they can learn the skills, but also uh, you can pay them a lot more for it. But uh, with young people, like kids that you know can't talk or just super cute, is put them in your social media, use them in your videos, use them on your pictures on your website, you know, sh use that as part of your branding. And as you do that, you can pay them for their likeness, like you would pay a model, mm -hmm. right? And so this is how you can pay your kids like a decent rate, because obviously uh, a toddler is not going to be able to do much. I mean, they could pretend to try and sweep up, but it's pretty hard to justify 12 grand a year. But if their cuteness brings people into the office and helps you get more likes on Instagram and grow your following or whatever your business is like, that can really add up. And so you can justify paying your kids that way um, as long as you're using them. And if you haven't been using them, start using them, right? Now, obviously mm -hmm. that's a personal choice and I know some people don't want to do that, but that's another big one where if you've got multiple kids, this is where you can be essentially socking away their college fund uh, into things for tax free, right? Or bringing money in and the kids can pay for their own private schools and their own, or their own clothes, their own stuff. And all those are tax free dollars. And if you're in a very high tax bracket, that's an extra 20, 25, 30, 35% that you're not having to shell out in order for, to get their clothes or their education or whatever. Right. So, oh. yeah. And I'm from Utah. People have a lot of kids here, so that can be a big deal. It can be a big deal. And not only that, if you're really honestly using your kids in your business, yeah. you're teaching them skills that a lot of kids are not going to know. So you're giving them not only the extra money, but you're also giving them a leg up and a skill set that normally they wouldn't have had access to, to as well. So that's actually a, what I call a good thing for both sides because it allows them to grow. And a lot of people one of the most common things when I started thinking about kids working for the family business is farms. You have a lot of farms out there and they're learning massive life skill sets and getting paid to do it. Yeah. I think there's a million good things that happen if you teach the kids how to, you know, earn their own money and then how to spend their own money. So like my mother used to do this, she'd give us a certain amount of money for for our school clothes. And we had to determine how we wanted to do that. If I wanted to go buy a pair of the jo of Jordans and they were so expensive, then everything else was going to suffer. Right. Or some of these other things. And, you know, I'm not a, a fan of like budgeting your kids to death or making it super hard on them, but make them accountable, make them practice, make them live in the real world. People don't talk to their kids about money. And then they wonder why their kids don't know anything about it. Right. Like I, I find it ironic that the only thing we're really taught about money in schools is how to count it. That's it. Nobody's yep. teaching you how to budget. Nobody's teaching you how to invest. Guess who you learn how to invest from? The guy who wants you to invest with him. Right. Mm -hmm. Guess who you learn about uh, health care from? Usually from the hospital when you get hurt. Right. Like we need to spend some time, talk with our kids. Uh, talk with our spouses. That's another big one I see is that spouses don't communicate around money. Usually one or the other takes the lead. And then they wonder when, when they do something and it doesn't work out, the other spouse looks at them like, what'd you do? Right. Or they're in the dark or somebody passes away or gets sick and the other one doesn't know what's going on. It's fine for one person to take the lead. Um, it's fine for you as a parent to guide your kids, but I think you need to have people's buy-in and get them participating and keep them in the loop the more you talk about it, the better you get at it, right? It's like not yep. talking about your health or t teaching your kid about health. How are they going to end up 
probably yeah. unhealthy, right? They're going to eat Cheetos all day and lay around and watch Netflix. Exactly. So it's the same thing with money. And you brought up an interesting point when you slid that in there just a little bit when you were talking about potential um, when your spouse or somebody passes away. Mm-hmm. What is one of the things, because I know you deal with the financial aspect of it too as well. Sure. What should anybody that has a partner with spouses should there be an exit plan or exit strategy? And if one of them happens to pass away, what is some of the things that they actually need if, you know, your business is still going and then all of a sudden they're not here? Well, if you're in business with your spouse, there's something called a, uh, a buy-sell agreement or a key person uh, plan. And usually that involves life insurance. And, and the idea is, let's say you have two partners, right? Or a husband and wife, and they one of them handles the books and the other one handles like the operations of the business as far as like the front end stuff. Uh, If one of them passes away, now there's money there to be able to keep the business going until you can hire someone to replace that person and to go through grief and, and deal with the things that you need to deal with. Or if you're a partner with somebody who you're not related to, if they pass away, not only do you have to keep the business going, but you might end up in business with their spouse or their kids Right. So a buy sell agreement has life insurance in place that will pay them off. So you're buying them out of the business. You now own the business and then you can take whatever other portion of that is allocated for you to continue to run the business. So having um, succession planning in place that way, it's not super hard. And if you're using like term life insurance, it's very affordable. But those are like little things that save people from having a huge headache of having to deal with somebody's spouse who now owns half the business and they maybe they don't get along or maybe that person doesn't know anything about it. And now what do you do? Right. So a little bit of planning goes a long way. Um, If somebody's going to pass away, I mean, it's really good. This is once again, talking to your family, your spouse about the assets that you do have, where are the safety deposit box? There's a a company called the torch where they have uh, a place where you can go in online on the cloud and you can document, here's all my bank accounts, here's all my stuff, here's where you feed the dog, here's safety deposit boxes we have, or there's some gold buried in the backyard or whatever. You can put all that kind of stuff in there so that if you pass away, uh, your spouse or whoever you designate can go in, get that information, they know where to find things, they know what you have. I, I mean, I deal a lot with life insurance. We teach a, a strategy where people can create their own banking system with a really specialized kind of life insurance. Um, and people don't even know they have the life insurance policies, right? They yeah. pass away and there's tons of money. There's like a, there's a website you can go to to see if, if, you're, uh, if there's life insurance unclaimed on a person. But there, there's a lot of that out there that just never gets claimed. So Having it written down somewhere, at least the basics, I have life insurance policies, I've got assets here, I've got a safety deposit box here, and here's where the key is, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Having it documented can be super, super valuable for people. Definitely. And that's one of those things that definitely has been hitting home a lot here lately, because you do have not only the pandemic going on, but just normal everyday stuff. And I've had a couple of friends that unfortunately his mom ended up falling and it ended up going downhill from there. And Mm -hmm. he's dealing with trying to get all of her banking tied away, everything. And it's just been a mess because number one, she can't remember the passwords. So that's another huge one. She doesn't know where everything's at. So he's having to deal with all this and Mm -hmm. she hadn't even put his name on hardly anything. So when we're talking about succession planning, ladies and gentlemen, I know it's a hard thing to talk about, but please do it because I've seen now two instances in the last two months where we've had people close to us pass away and family has no clue. And I was just lucky that when my dad passed away that he actually had a will and he actually had a friend that gave us a copy of the will because then that way there was no argument about who said what and about how he wrote it down. And he had the information that was needed for me to be able to execute what needed to be done. So that is one of those things as you're growing your business, start thinking about those things, 
make sure that you have those wills put out, make sure that you have that succession planning because you just don't never know. And it's better to do it today than to worry about doing it later. And then your spouse or your kids are going to have trouble trying to get into that information that they sorely need. Yeah. Yeah. As a worst case scenario, like put it in a big folder, label it in your filing cabinet. No one's going to see it unless they go looking for it. But the filing cabinet's the first place people go. So yeah, exactly. And that's the first place I went when, with my dad. I was going like, okay, I know where his stuff was at. So I was lucky in that regard. So please, yeah, please do that. If anything, if you don't take anything else from this podcast today, <laughs> please take that because that is something that is definitely needed. So as we're about ready to wrap up, what is one last nugget, Derek, that you can give our small business owners that will really help them out, especially right now? You know, the biggest thing I can say, and I repeat myself on every podcast that I'm on, because I think it's that important, especially for business owners, is you, if you're not systematically saving money, even when you're not making a lot, you need to, you need to put something in place to systematically save every, every time you get paid. What happens is business owners, we have a tendency to make money and then we reinvest in the business and we make money and we reinvest in the business. And what happens is the business grows, which is great, but our wealth doesn't. And then something like COVID comes along and let's say you've been running a restaurant for three or four years and you've been reinvesting, 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 and then you've got no cash. And then this, this, this situation happens and you can lose everything. So I think if you can systematize saving 10 to 20% of every dollar that you make, setting it aside um, and putting it aside for a rainy day. At first, just put it in a savings account until you get up to maybe three months worth of living expenses. And then beyond that, you know, we recommend using the the life insurance strategy that I teach that turns turns it into a banking system. But, you know, some people like 401ks and IRAs. I don't love those for business owners because you lose control of your money. But uh, But generally speaking, just systematically saving that money. That's how you get wealthier every single year. I can't tell you how many business owners I talk to who have been in business for 10 years and they just haven't saved any money. And if you never save, you never have enough to invest and you never get money working for you. You're always working for money. So if you could, if you could just take one thing out of this podcast, it's that. And if you need help, um, you know, we'd love to help you out, whether it's taxes or, or, saving strategies or growing your money or whatever. And I think investment is a big thing. And I think some people get scared of it because you, I mean, you can lose the money, but sure. here's the thing though, you're losing money either way. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> if you're not going to save it, you're going to lose it. And I'm, you know, I hate to tell people, you know, this is not going to go away, but you know, times like this, they repeat we have a cyclical life and mm -hmm. that happens. I mean, that you're going to have good years and you're going to have bad years. So why not use a service like you offer to, you know, help pad for those bad years when they do come around. So then that way you're not struggling. And when you do pass away, maybe your hairs will have a little bit of something, you know, left to, you know, help continue to build that legacy. Absolutely. Preparation is everything. Yeah, definitely. Derek, I appreciate it. That is a wealth of knowledge. I learned quite a bit. I, you know, 75% of what you taught on this podcast, I had no clue about at all. <laughs> so thank you for coming on. I definitely appreciate it. And I think I'm hoping our viewers got something out of this. I think they did. Um, I know I've had a couple of them comment and I can't wait to see what they do with this information because this is definitely handy and I definitely appreciate it. My pleasure. I love to see business owners succeed and uh, too many of them are good at business and not so good at the other parts of money. So we want to help with that. Definitely. So y'all can find Derek on facebook.com slash Derek dot Venice. And you can find him on there. Message him. I'm sure he would help you out with investing and helping save your money. Absolutely. So everyone have a good evening. Derek as awesome. And as always, everybody, you are unstoppable, whether you know it or not. And you are the beacon of hope. Everybody have a good evening.
Bye.